Hello everybody, and this is Zap Snapperman with Planning Platinum Blade Episode 3, a series where I go through my process of planting, playing, and writing a Pokemon fanfiction Nuzlocke. In this episode we'll be discussing the changes that I'll be doing to Orberg Town, and how I've reached these decisions, as well as how I write Pokemon personalities, because I do not like writing them as people and I'll get into some things that I do not like and why I do not like doing them. So, first of all, let's have a look at the list of creatures available in Orberg and around Orberg with this randomizer. In Orberg Gate, there is Slugma, Sveal, and Pineco. In Orberg Mine, there are Bampi, Makuita, Volbeat, Chikorita, Pidgey, and Shieldon. And on Route 207, just to the north of Orberg Town, there are Sandshrew, Grimer, Dugtrio, and Caterpie. So, just looking at this, there is quite a number of ground types, or at least while playing it, it felt like there was a lot of ground and fire type that I was encountering. As there is Donpan, Shieldon, Sandshrew, Dugtrio, and Slugma. The other things did not show up nearly as often. Though Grimer was fairly common on Route 207, and I only encountered one Caterpie. The Spheels came in late in my uh, grinding in Orberg Gate, and the Chikoritas were the most common non-ground type in Orberg Mine. What this tells me is that there is something that has changed in Orberg, that has made it more appealing to ground types. So there is poison for some reason, quite a bit of fire, and something that Chikorita likes. Now, I've got Chikorita listed as both a consumer and provider. This means that they, are bo they can both create their own food, like plants do, and like many plant grass Pokemon do in this system but they also can eat other things such as plants or certain types of other Pokemon. I would most likely say in this case they would do well catching and killing uh, probably Shieldon and maybe Fampi. And we can even look at Orberg Mine and see that there is a, an ecology here. Chikorita feeds off Fampi and Shieldon Volbeat feeds off Chikorita and Pidgey feeds off Volbeat. So I'm not sure where Makuita comes into play. Slugma and Sveal are an interesting combination in Orberg Gate with the addition of Pineco for some reason I don't quite understand. And Sandshrew and Doug Trio on Route 207 are quite likely to make a lot of holes that Grimer can live in. Though I think looking at this, that there was some form of natural disaster in Orberg, most likely, most likely an earthquake that has accessed some, uh, that has broken open and broken into some underground problems. Looks like a magmatic chamber in one location over near Orberg Gate, and some form of uh, toxic gas near Route 207 with only small creatures such as Sandshrew or Caterpie being able to survive in that air or Doug Trio and Diglett being able to live around that area and, and Grimer just loving the smell. I am focusing on the lava at Orberg Gate instead of the cold because I simply encountered more Slugma. I don't know why, I don't know how I'm going to factor Sveal in. I might just drop it and not include it because it does not play into the story. Same with Makuita and Doug Trio. The things that will definitely play into the story in this area are Slugma, Pineco, Fanpy, most likely Chikorita, and Caterpie. Those ones I know will play in because Pineco, Fanpy, and Caterpie are part of Shiro's team during this playthrough. So we will be definitely including some of them. So if there's been this natural disaster at Orberg, it's most likely that many people have evacuated, which would make it a lot easier to write the area and would give it a nice uh, wasteland or desolate moon kind of vibe, a, a sci-fi kind of vibe that would be fun to just play into a little bit near the start, especially with Team Galactic, or as I'm calling them in this series, Team Plasma, 
uh, taking over the Sinnoh region, it might be fun to have some references to space. Now the Orberg gym leader, actually in Orberg city, with this large earthquake, maybe there's been a fissure and many buildings have collapsed or been ripped apart. Possibly only the Pokemon Center and Pokemon Gym remain. I like to think that this was caused by something that, that Rourke did. Something in the mines that Rourke did. And now Rourke has been put on trial. And many people have evacuated the city anyway. So over at the other city, and I can write this while Shiro is in that city, Rourke is currently on trial because of this natural this disaster he caused. So another gym leader has been placed on in Orberg just to pass the time until something more permanent has been found. And in this case we have gym leader Marshall. Which I like the idea of it being a temporary gym leader. We'll come back to Marshall later. Now Marshall include Marshall has a Luxio a stun key and a water type of some description that I have forgotten, though it was probably just a couple seconds ago. Or right now. So, how are we going to be able to do this? What are we going to use these three Pokemon for? How is Marshall using these three Pokemon here? Well, I do feel the water type would do well for holding back lava or preventing fires in certain areas. The Luxio can. The Luxio apparently has the ability to see through walls, if I remember correctly. So that might be a fun thing for it to play on and use. It could be the way he's searching the place for things. And the Stunky is simply as a, a, ga a gas filter. So they don't breathe in any toxic gas. Somehow the Stunky's getting rid of it. Maybe its own pheromones counteract it. Could be interesting to use. Now, another thing to t take into consideration, at least during this location, is that... Shiro gets a TM here, TM something, which teaches Thunder Punch, and she can use this to teach it to any of her Pokemon. How do TMs work in this world, and where does she find it? Because TMs are expendable, and I'm not going to put in a cheat to remove that, TMs are going to remain expendable in this world, I like the idea of her using her, t her simply applying the TM as like a USB or something into a Pokeball and that, t that converting the brain structure of the Pokemon in the Pokeball ever so slightly to make the Pokemon know that move. So in this case, Thunder Punch could be a USB she's just found in someone's house while looking around. Because I don't like the idea of the gym leader just handing out TMs because, yeah, we hand out TMs. We also hand out badges. Everyone gets two. She finds Thunder Punch in someone's house as she's looking around, just exploring because she feels like it. She's amused by the whole idea of the area. So that moves to a very interesting point, interesting question. Pokeballs. Will Shiro be using Pokeballs? And I think she will. She'll be the first of my Nuzlocke protagonists to actively use Pokeballs, but she's also the first of my protagonists to take on the gym challenge. So that will be a fun situation. We have... Is there a particular Pokeball that she would likely prefer to use? Well, of course, there'd be Snag Balls, but they don't exist in this world. Though I do think it would be applicable to include a cheat that makes it so she can catch other trainers' Pokemon, just so she can steal it from them. And if done correctly, if she successfully steals a Pokemon from a trainer, that just counts as her catch for the route. Same as standard Nuzlocke rules, it's just she steals a Pokemon, so that counts as her catch there. Okay, so... That's not terrible. She's probably got some form of training in, uh... in field hacking Pokeballs to change the owner, the owner ID. And changing the owner ID is probably why the Pokemon just is fine with her, likes her, even after it gets stolen, because the trainer ID just makes them like whatever trainer they've been caught by. Could be an interesting thing to play on. A subtle darkness to the functionality of Pokeballs. 
in that they're not just a slave system, though I don't usually use them as slave systems anyway, but they are able to just slightly change the brain chemistry or the brain structure of any Pokemon caught within them. They would explain certain things like why a Pokemon is willing to follow the, the orders of any trainer with a certain number of badges and it's just that those certain number of badges are those badges are wirelessly connected to the Pokeballs that the people are, that the trainer is carrying and the more badges they have the, the stronger uh, control lock they can put on Pokemon because po as a Pokemon gains level, gains strength they gain they gain willpower and this willpower can enable them to break free of the control and once you have eight gym badges there is just too much force keeping the personality down even just subtly though that would that would add a, a freakish layer to Pokeballs because I've added uh, happy layers and interesting bits about the mechanics already in other games but I think the the gym badge thing might might work well and might be good something good to explore over the course of the game and would help me in writing the Pokemon personalities so the first thing I want to state about writing Pokemon personalities is that I do not like Pokespeak and I do not like just the straight up evolution as is done in the games or the anime. I will use something equivalent of that, but if there's ever a flashing light sort of evolution, it's always going to occur off screen where the character where the protagonist doesn't see it, so the audience doesn't see it. So, these Pokemon are animals, and if we're going to have them as animals, we need to treat them treat their personalities as animal like, but still make them relatable likeable, understandable. Animals are a lot more involved as characters than people give them credit for. And a quick way, just like when writing the protagonist, is for each Pokemon's nature and characteristic at least, to inform how you write about them, even if you just go the complete opposite of what it says in the game. For example, you catch a mild Pokemon and you think that this Pokemon is obviously not mild, this Pokemon, at least when you write it, should be serious. Would be fun, interesting to do, would be a change from the game, but still keep uh, how good it is in combat and the sort of combat style it uses. So you're, you're not necessarily tying the nature to its combat style in story, but you are still tying it, its combat style in story to its nature in the game. Its characteristic can be very easy, a Pokemon that likes to take siestas might easily fall asleep when Pokemon are using hypnosis or, or sing or yawn. And Pokemon need to have likes, dislikes, something they find fun. For example, Inti, the ghastly in this uh, story, though it will eventually become a Gengar in the game, I'm considering only keeping it as a haunter in the story. It, it has to evolve in the game because it gets more powerful, it's easier to actually play the Nuzlocke. But for the purposes of the, of the story, it can quite happily stay as whatever tier I want it to be. I can keep the Spinarak as a Spinarak. I, I could keep the Fanpy as a Fanpy. Though I think it would work to just have them being evolved over the course of the story when they do evolve. But for Inti, I don't think he's got. I don't think it, she's going to evolve past Haunter. I do like the uh, the mental image of Shiro walking around with a pair of Haunter hands on her shoulders, and Inti's main body head thing floating behind her head. It it just the image that strikes me is amusing and interesting. I can see NT reacting, acting somewhat like a Rayman sort of thing, especially when Shiro wants to be subtle, but do something, something strangely abnormal out in civilized company. Have NT possessing 
her physical form, but not influencing her combat or her decisions or her personality. It's more that her choices are influencing Inti and because Inti is possessing, she doesn't need to give commands. It's just thought relay. And that's something that can be very very easily conveyed at least in written at least in written media. But Inti gets mental commands and then can move its hands independently of Shiro's body. So it acts, it would appear as some form of limited telekinesis, but it's simply because she's got a ghost helping her. This is also going to be the first time I've written a ghost Pokemon for one of my protagonists, and it's going to be the starter, which will be interesting. It's a small episode, and I do apologise for that. I will have more, I will have more work in a later episode more things to go over. I'm looking for music to use as backdrop for this as well as potentially an intro or outro just so it doesn't just immediately start and then immediately end. Give it some form of flow. I would like an intro and outro but I need to find things that are good and possibly an animator because I am, as you can tell, not very good with video manipulation. So I'm going to bid you adieu and see you in episode 4 where we will be talking about Team Plasma and why I'm calling them that. Okay, thank you.